Hi, welcome back to Into My Own Headspace. My name's Rebecca. Last time I was on here, I sort of jumped into my journey with mental health, and that's what I'm hoping to use this platform for, to share my own journey with you, to help others struggling with mental health, and to get some other people on here in the future that have also suffered with mental health. So I want to put a kind of disclaimer out there. Uh, I do talk about my personal story, what I've personally gone through, drinking, self-harm, uh, and if any of those things will trigger you, um, please listen at your own risk or don't listen. Um, I just want to put that out there. I don't want to trigger anyone and anything that I may talk about. I'm just hoping that my story will help others out there. So last time I left off um, with me getting pulled over and getting a DUI. So I'm going to pick back up there. Um, I was just going through some stuff, some pictures on my phone, um, and actually trying to pull up if I could like pull up what I used to have to check in with. Uh, so it actually happened in the fall of 2017. Um, I think I was thinking it was the fall of 2018, but it was actually the fall of 2017, uh, right before I left that barn job. So fast forward, I, or not fast forward, so I went back to work the next day like nothing had happened. Um, my car got impounded. I had to pay a couple hundred dollars to get that out. I, and then I started the process. Um, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what I was going to be charged with, how aggressive it was going to be, my fines, nothing like that. Um, until I started getting papers. Um, I blew a .23, I believe. Um, well above the legal limit. Uh, so I was charged with a DUI. Um, that's a year without your license. Uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, it was my first offense in the state of Pennsylvania for driving under the influence. However, I have a previous charge, um, which is no longer on my record. I got in trouble when I was down at senior week as a senior in college or in high school back in 2010. So you can get in this first time offenders program and they basically expunge it off your record. You do community service and you take classes and you do all this stuff. I got it dropped. So it's expunged from my record. However, that counted towards this as well. So because I did that for that time, I was not able to do that for the DUI. So I had to take everything that came with it, um, which meant lots of fines. I don't know a total of what I paid. I know it was a lot, um, probably a couple thousand dollars when I was all said and done. They had made payments. Um, I had to go to court and plead guilty. I did it. Like, they drew blood. They had my breathalyzer. There was no... I can't deny what I did. Um, and no car, no license. Like, how am I going to work? How am I going to get anywhere? That whole, like, oh, I'm never drinking again thing was, like, actually happening now. I had been sat down for my by my parents a couple months before, like, we think you have a drinking problem, we want to get you help, and I was like, I'm fine. I should have listened, but I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to hear it from someone else that was telling me to do something. I thought I knew what I was doing. I thought I was in the, my own headspace. I was like, I got this. I'm an adult. I'm just living my life. I'm enjoying it. I'm feeling good. Just let me have fun. I got my DUI and it was a wake up call like, oh shit, maybe I shouldn't be partying as much as I am. Maybe I shouldn't be drinking this much. Maybe this isn't the road I want to go down, the path that I want to take. I started taking classes. I had to go to alcohol counseling. So I went to Malvern Institute for that. Um, and sat with a bunch of other people that were in there for DUIs from a number of things from like their second and third DUI to a mother who had one glass of wine 
and was driving home from either lunch or dinner with her kids and got pulled over and then also got charged with reckless endangerment because she had children in the car. So just like that, one glass of wine, your entire world can instantly come crashing down on you when you're driving home. It's scary. You might think you're okay, but that doesn't mean that your breathalyzer and your blood work is going to come back and say you're okay. Everyone processes alcohol differently. It depends on what you ate that day, how fast your body processes it, what kind of alcohol you had. There's so much else that goes into it, which learning through all this stuff, some of it I was like, do I really have to do this? But I got it. I had to do it. You meet a lot of people along the way too, people that had been worse off than you had and people that had just kind of, you know, you think like wrong place, wrong time, but they could have hurt someone else or someone else could have hurt them or you just never know. So I took my classes. I was just looking back on it. So I probably did that like I got my DUI in October, September, October of 2017. So I think I started the classes right away. So November, December 2017. Um, I left there in February of 2018. I finished my classes. And in order to get my interlock in my car, I had to do all of this. So I wanted to drive. I wanted to work. Um, by this point, I was working for my parents. And I was going to try to start working at a gym. And... But I had to be honest with people, like, hey, this is what happened. I'm trying to get my life back together, but I want to work. So in order to do that, it was an interlock. So I had to blow into a breathalyzer to start my car. I had to pay to get it installed. And I had to only take it to a certain shop because only certain shops know how to deal with things like that. So they had to put it in my car for me. I remember that cost me three or four hundred dollars because I have like a push to start car. So it's a little bit more complicated and they try to hide the wires and he's like, I did the best I could. I'm like, whatever. I don't it is what it is at this point. Like, I gotta have it. Plus my court fees, plus my fines, plus my counseling. You pay for all that. So when they tell you like you can't afford a DUI, it's like real it happens. It's so much money. Um, it probably cost me more than five grand all said and done. Probably closer to seven to eight. Um, if I would add up all my interlock fees and my counseling fees and my court fees and my fines that I paid, all of that stuff to get my car out of the impound lot. So I can only take it to this one shop. I, if I failed it, so at this point I wasn't drinking anymore. But uh, mouthwash would set it off. If I brushed my teeth and like I didn't rinse well enough and then I went to start my car, it would fail me. And it like failed you once and if you didn't rinse quick enough and like try to blow into it again, it would fail you. If I had an energy drink, fail me. There's sugar alcohol in there. It finds that. Listerine, good luck. You're failing. Um, and like they told me it was sensitive. And then you sometimes you forget or you like brush your teeth, you hop in the car, you try to blow into it and you're like, shit, here we go again. You have to pass if you don't pass. It fails you, so you have seven days to take it back to the shop and get it recalibrated, which costs you more money. If you don't do it within that seven days, you're totally locked out of your car, and then essentially you would have to get your car towed to the shop to have them replace it. So the first time I ever got locked out, I lost it because I thought that if I just got locked out, my car wouldn't start. So it's a very big learning curve. It's very stressful. It's very anxious because... You're driving, you're driving, and all of a sudden it beeps, beep, beeps, and like you have to blow into it within a matter of time. So you have to stay driving or you have to pull over and blow into it or it fails you. So you couldn't like have your sober friend start your car and then hop in and start going and think you're okay and get behind the wheel again like that. So it's constantly going off. If you don't blow hard enough, it doesn't register. I didn't know how like little lung capacity I had until I had to try to blow into a breathalyzer to start my car. But I wanted to work. I wanted to be able to go places. So that's what I had to do. Excuse me. I joined AA. It finally took my parents' advice. And I reached out to someone who was involved in the program and put me in touch with a woman at the time who was around my age. So six years ago. So she was in her early 20s too. Um, 
And I remember sitting in my closet at my parents' house talking to her on the phone for probably an hour and a half. Um, talking about my drinking in college, talking about my DUI, talking about my drinking outside of college, my anxiety, my depression, and just like drinking numbed it. And she got it. She listened. Um, I'm getting chills just talking about it. She had a lot of the same things that she went through just as I did. And it was really easy to talk to her. I had never talked to this girl before. I never met her before. I had no idea who she was from like Sally down the road. But we were, it was just easy to talk to her. I felt like I could trust her and I, she was part of it. So she sent me up with my first ever meeting. Um, I went to one in Westchester. It was a bunch of young people and that's what she told me. And she's like, you're going to look for my friend and she's going to help you. And so I go meet this girl and call her by her nickname, which was funny because it was like what she popped up in my phone as, as this other girl sent me her number. And she's like, why are you calling me that? That's not my name. And I was like, that was your contact. So I was slightly embarrassed. They were all kids. Like, I don't know, I call kids like in their early 20s, like at this point. I can't do the math off the top of my head. Um, I was 25, 26. Um, there were guys and girls in their early 20s, mid to late 20s, 30s. And I sat down and they welcomed you to the meeting. They asked if anyone was new. You walk up, which I hate going in front of anyone. So to me, I was like mortified and you get your 24 hour coin. Um, that my parents house. I wish I would have brought them home to show them on the video. I'll bring them next time. I have seven. Um, you get a 24 hour chip. You've been sober for 24 hours. And sometimes they had a speaker. Sometimes they hit a topic, they'd hit like a chapter or a page out of the big book. Um, the big book's like this thick, huge book that's called Alcoholics Anonymous. And it has 12 steps. And it fucking works. Um, I met more people at that meeting. They invited me to other meetings. I got connected with a sponsor. She's been sober for over 20 years now I think which is insane it's fucking incredible um and she helps a lot of women I met a lot of great people through that organization um and a lot of good friends you relate to people so much that are just like you and I don't think we realize it until you're put into a room with a bunch of fucking alcoholics and you hear these people's stories and you're like, holy shit, that was, that was me. Oh, and that, oh, I did that too. But it starts to make you feel like you're not alone. It starts to make you feel like, wow, I'm not the only person. I still feel guilty for my actions, but part of me felt a little less guilty because it wasn't just me. There were other people also just like me. So you start to feel comfort, you feel safe, you feel okay. And it's such a loving, tight-knit community. Like, um, you know, someone shares their story, they say thanks for sharing and you start clapping. You feel good. You don't feel scared to talk in front of them. I mean, yes, I was always a little anxious, but like you feel like they're not judging you. Like you can just open up and be yourself and talk about your story and it's going to be okay. You share your experience, strength, and hope and it helps others. You find groups of people that are just like you, that are your age, that are going through the same thing. I had no idea there were so many young people that were going through the same shit that I was. It was crazy. I was like, I must, like, there's no way. There were so many of us. And we all had different ways to cope. We all had different reasons why we started it. But we were all in the same place to get better. We were there to help one another. You hug it out at the end. You pray to your higher power, whoever that may be. 
and you start working the system. And the first thing is admitting that you are, I wish I knew the exact words. Let me see if I can find Um, you're limitless over alcohol. Step one AA. It's the second thing on Google. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol. And you start to work through that. You understand that you have no control over it. It controls you. And that's basically what it was. My anxiety was controlling me and my alcohol was cold and controlling my anxiety. And I didn't know that I wasn't controlling anything. I wasn't in control of my own life anymore. I was letting my anxiety and my depression just burn me down and take me out. And I was letting alcohol make it better. And it didn't really make it better. It made it worse. So I got started, I started to be held accountable. Excuse me. I, like I said, had a woman who helped me through the 12 steps. Um, I never made it all the way. I made it to making an amends. Um, but I worked through it. I went to different meetings. I spoke at my first meeting. Uh, what's the 12 parts of this? I wanted the 12 steps. That was scary. Uh, I didn't know what it was going to be like, but I knew I needed to So I made it to like 9, 10. Um, you make a moral inventory of yourself. And you just kind of work through your life. You work through your life as an alcoholic. You work through the people you hurt. You work through the things you hurt. How you hurt yourself. And you talk it out with people. I didn't know at the time, but it helped me so much. I was so scared to go through certain steps, realizing how much internal shit was going to come up that I thought I'd never have to talk about. Um, I just buried it away. Stuff that I'm not proud of. Stuff that I hurt other people. Uh, I pushed people away that were closest to me because... I felt like I had to. My anxiety and my depression would take over and I would make up these crazy stories in my head like or I would overthink things and overthink things and I would start reading into situations that there was nothing to read into but internally I felt like there was and then the more I read into it the more anxious I got the more depressed I got about things and I'd slowly slowly just put my wall up and push those closest to me away from me. I didn't care if I heard them or not. At the time, I was like, well, if I hurt you first, then you can't hurt me. If I push you away first, you're never going to hurt me. And I put my guard up. And I didn't know how to let people in. And AA helped me let people in. I went and talked at a recovery center. Um, I shared my story at a meeting. I was terrified. But I did it. And I'd help. And I was welcomed with open arms. And people came up to me afterwards because they got something out of my story. And it helped them. Or it brought up something that, you know, they wanted to share. And that's what I hope to do by making this podcast is to help others share their story. And help others realize that they're not alone and you too can get through this as well. It was life changing. And at the time it's what I needed. I didn't know it. I thought I was just going to be fine. I didn't want to listen to my parents a couple months earlier. And I didn't. 
But then my world came crashing down. I was driving around with an interlock in my car. I was getting locked out. I wasn't drinking. I was sober. I was collecting chips every month and kept going back to meetings, multiple meetings a week. And I was working the steps and I was starting to feel better. I was learning how to cope with my anxiety, how to cope with my depression. And I realized I could have fun without drinking. And I think that was something that was super hard for me because when I drank, I opened up emotionally. I opened up to be a more outgoing, let's go have fun, I'm not going to sit in the corner kind of Rebecca. And when I wasn't drinking, I felt like I wasn't fun. I felt like no one wanted to be around me. I was just quiet. I was to myself. I was an introvert. I'm still an introvert. And I didn't want to be that person anymore. So drinking helped me not be that person. It helped me be this crazy, outgoing, fun, let's go fucking party girl. I ended up just hurting myself. It wasn't a good place to be. It wasn't healthy. Um, an AA helped me change that. I was serving at the time. Uh, they told me it like, wasn't a good idea to serve and like work in a bar type restaurant while I was trying to get sober. But I thought I could do it. So part of me still thought I was fucking invincible. Um... And I was like, no, it's fine. I'm just going to keep doing it. I can get through it. I can get through it. I can push through it. Um, it was kind of ironic one night sitting at the bar with my friend. And this random guy was sitting next to us. And there's like this triangle symbol in AA. I'm pretty sure it's a triangle. And I was like, made some comment about his tattoo. He was drinking. But he used to be sober. <laughs> and... Uh, when I was thinking about doing this podcast, I, that memory popped up. And my friend was like, only you would like run into some sober guy at the bar <laughs> and reminisce over OAA. Um, and I like brought him to a meeting of a bunch of young people. And I have no idea whatever happened to him. I don't know if he's drinking, if he got sober. I have no clue. Um, but it's just crazy how the universe works like that. It puts people into your life that you never thought would have been in there before. My first meeting when I went to meet my sponsor, she was laid. So I sat down next to this other girl that I had no idea who she was. We just started talking because we both got told by our sponsor we should be there. And then she was running behind. Um, but like, we ended up being great friends. And it's just one of those things you just never know how things are going to work out. You never know who's going to come into your life and help you move past that point. And who's going to help you overcome that. And move on from that. Um... I had that thing in my car for a year. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was an entire year. Uh, by the end, I was counting down the days to get that thing out of my car. I didn't want to drink. It was just the point of having it in there. It was like just an, it was a constant reminder of where I used to be. That constant reminder of where I never wanted to be again. And it forced me to remember it and live through it every single day. And I couldn't get rid of it. I had to keep it in there until I was told I could take it out. Um, I went to AA for six months. I remember going to Florida. Um... By this point, I was off probation. So I was also on probation for my DUI. So I had to check in with a probation officer. But because I was a good kid, and I wasn't a flight risk, I had to call them or email him. So it'd be like, I don't know, Tuesday during the week or like once a month on Tuesday, I'd have to like email him or text. I'd have to call in. That's what I have to do. I remember sitting in an AA meeting and being like, shit, I didn't call my probation officer out today. They're like, that's okay, you can just call in, like, it'll be recorded. So I called in, and you have to, like, hit numbers, like, has your address changed? Have you smoked this week? Have you drank this week? Have you done this? Have you drunk, drank under the influence? Have you done this? Like, are you still working? Are you still this? Are you still that? And you, like, hit your numbers for everything, and then you hang up, and that's it. And it was as easy as that. 
but it was one more thing to hold me accountable. One more thing to keep me sober. One more thing to keep my head out of my anxiety, my depression, but also a reminder of where I came from and where I did not want to go back to. Um, it was an experience. Um, one that I wouldn't want to go through again. One that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. It's a lot. Um, meeting friends, meeting new people, getting in my car, trying to help friends out or babysitting kids, and then, oh, but wait, I have this thing I have to start my car with. It put me in a vulnerable position a lot. I had to get very comfortable being uncomfortable. And I think I've kind of lost sight of that since then. But I had to tell people what was going on. I used to drive horses to Florida. Um, and that year I couldn't go across state lines. Like I couldn't drive without this interlock. So I had to tell my dad. At this point he didn't know. Um, we were driving him home that spring. Maybe it was that December. It was that December. Um, we were driving him down for the winter. So I couldn't drive without that. Um, and I couldn't get caught across state lines without an inter like without having my interlock. So I was allowed to leave, but I couldn't be driving behind a car without an interlock in it. And I couldn't put one in their truck. So I had to sit passenger while my dad drove 21 hours so that I could be there to check on the horses, but I couldn't drive. Talk about making me feel shitty. I had to tell people I was gonna work for. I had to explain it to them. I had to get vulnerable. I had to get embarrassed. And I think it opened a lot eyes for a lot of people. I think I had friends that didn't realize how easy it was to do it. Um, to have a glass of wine at lunch or have three drinks at dinner and think you're okay and drive home and find out you're not. I hope I help some people stop drinking and driving, even if you're just going from dinner to home. It doesn't take very much. It stopped me. I'm forever grateful I didn't hurt anyone. And then it was just me in my car and no one else was involved. Um, but I got through it and I overcame it and I started finding other ways to cope. I started going to meetings. I started working at a gym and I found that training and helping people was helpful to me. I was training myself um, by this point more healthy than I was before. I didn't go out on benders after I was drinking and then take a fat burner and then go live on the stair machine because, yeah, I did that. Um, I didn't drink anymore, so that wasn't an option. I just was working out. I was working. And I was trying to leave that old me in the past. It changed who I was. It'll never leave me. But I can overcome it. And now I can talk about it. I needed healthier coping mechanisms. I needed ways to get through those dark days and not take it out on myself. Because essentially drinking and the self-harming, I was just taking it out on myself. And then hurting the others around me while I was doing that. I signed on with my first bodybuilding coach in August of 2018. And I said I wanted to do a show. I think... I needed the restriction. 
by that point, and I wasn't in AA anymore. Um, I kind of pulled myself out of it. I'd gone on a trip. I had one cider at lunch, and I came home, and I remember feeling so guilty that I had to tell my mom, like, I have to tell her I did this. She'd be so disappointed in me, and she was. She was. Um, I think she thought I was going to go right back down that hole, right back down to where it was, right back to drinking all the time, right back to just using that to cope. And I didn't. I said I wasn't going to. Um, I had to come clean in AA about what I did. Um, I didn't go back after that. I knew that I couldn't go back if I wanted to like go have a drink with a friend, I couldn't, it wouldn't be honest. And I wasn't going to keep going to something that I couldn't be a hundred percent truthful in. So I just stopped. I think my time there was up and I thought that I could handle it on my own. And I did. I had self-control. I wasn't using it as a coping mechanism anymore. I was training, I was eating better, and when I started doing that stuff, I started mentally feeling better about myself. I needed that to also change. The foods we eat and the, I don't mean to get like on a nutrition, food, fitness tangent, but the crap you put in your body makes you essentially feel like crap. I was drinking, I was eating garbage. All that stuff affects your gut. You don't think that doesn't mess with your head? It does. It made my anxiety worse. Because I'd wake up feeling like crap, or I'd feel bloated, or I'd feel crappy when I looked in the mirror because little did I know, like I just drank five Jack and Double diets, or Diet Coke, Jack and Diets last night, doubles, plus whatever food I decided to eat. And then I would come home and maybe I'd eat like, I don't know, whatever I could find in my parents' pantry. And then I'd wake up the next morning and feel like crap, and then I'd be like, eh, I'll just take this fat burner and go live on the stamp machine. That <laughs> jacked up my gut like no other. It jacked up my head. My hormones and my cortisol level had to be through the freaking roof. I was stressed. I was stressed about life. The first time I ever got blood work done, I'll never forget the doctor asked me, he's like, what is so stressful? You're 26, 27. He's like, your cortisol is like a 22. He's like, what is stressful? And I was like, life. <laughs> like, that's what it is. That's what I thought. That's how I was. Like, I overthought and overanalyzed every little fucking minute detail of my life. Like, someone said hi to me. If they said it in a different tone or they didn't look at me, I'd be like, oh my God, do they like, do they like me? Do they hate me? What did I do wrong? Did I do this? Did I do that? Like, Maybe they think I'm someone else or like maybe they remember me from before. Maybe I'm like, it's insane. I would drive myself crazy and tired with the amount of spinning my head would do. But it was my anxiety. Like I just constantly overthought and overanalyzed every situation. Drinking calmed that all down. It made it less. And that's why I did it. But now I don't have that. Now there is no drinking, but my anxiety is still creeping up. It's still there. It's still part of me. So now I go to the gym. And I let music and the weights be my outlet. I started getting obsessed with that. And a healthy obsession in the fact that I had a coach that kept me on track for food and exercise. So never to the point where I was over-exercising and under-eating. So that became too extreme like drinking did. I never hit that point in exercise. And that structure kept me on point. When I started prep for my first show, I wasn't allowed to drink. So by this point, I would like, you know, if I was out to dinner or something, maybe I'd have a glass of wine. But I wasn't drinking like I used to. And then as soon as prep started, that was it. No alcohol. And I did it. And I felt fine. I didn't need that 
void filled anymore. I didn't need that alcohol to feel like that outgoing person that needed to break free of that shell. And it changed. But my anxiety still kept up, crept up. And it still creeps up. And my depression still creeps up. But it hits in different ways now. When I started competing, I was on a meal plan. And I was dating a guy who I'm still dating. Um, and I would go, we'd go like to, you know, a party with his friends. And I bring like my Tupperware because I was in prep where I was like, oh, I have to eat on my meal plan. My dad used to make fun of me. He'd be like, you can eat it. You're just not choosing to. Because I'd be like, oh, I'm not allowed to eat that. And he'd be like, you're allowed to. No one's telling you you can. I'm like, yeah, 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 I get it. But I needed that structure. I needed that guidance from someone to be like, hey, here's a healthy way to go do this. Let's go try it. And the amount of mental strength I gained through that process was amazing. I felt better about myself. My confidence started to come back. When I had a bad day, I still went to the gym. Or I went for a walk. I had a goal in mind and that's what kind of helped me get through those bad days. Other bad days before I started that, I had no goal. So it's just like, I'll go to the gym. But if I pulled in and I got too anxious, I would just turn around and go home. And then I would just fester my own anxiety. I wouldn't, I never overcame it. I didn't get through it because I didn't. I didn't go in. I just turned around and went the fuck home. So like I never worked through that because I was, I just let it happen. And now I had a goal. Now I had something I was working towards. And I didn't want to let myself down. I didn't want to let my coach down. And I was going to fucking do it no matter what. But it helped me realize that on those bad days, just going for a walk with a dog or getting active could totally change my mood. It changed my endorphins. It got me feeling better. And like a little bit of movement could totally change my attitude. Um, it made tea. It was cold. It's a weird weather day in Pennsylvania. Uh, but it helped. And I think my greatest accomplishment of that was not something on stage. It was the post that my coach made of me of saying not only watching this girl transform physically, but her mental and her emotional transformation through this whole journey has been amazing. And it meant a lot. And he was there through all of it. Um, the ups and downs, the self-doubt, the... I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm ready for this. And having someone in your corner that's there to support you means a lot. It's having those people like I had in AA. Having that family, that just like close grip, close-knit group of people around you to help you be like, no, you do got this. And it may take you a little while to find those people out there, but we all have people like that in our life. And... You don't just want to stop trying to find them. They'll find you or you'll find them when you least expect it. I didn't know that taking spin class in 2017 at Warhouse Gym was going to lead me to finding my first coach, to going to a women's in strength um, group with Dana... Lynn Bailey, who is a fucking beast, and this lady named Miranda, I don't remember her last name, she was a CrossFitter, um, and I was at a dark place depression-wise at that point, and I was like, I just gotta make it to this event, I just gotta make it to this event, and you make it through the event, and you're like, wow, they have bad days too. Social media is not all glitz and glam. It is. It's all like that perfect lighting, that perfect angle, that perfect tan. 
But behind closed doors, we're all people. We all suffer from insecurities and self-doubt and questioning, do I post this or is this good enough? And honestly, if you feel good and you love the way you feel and look, who the fuck cares what anyone else thinks about you? They can say whatever they want. But if you feel good in here, it shouldn't matter. And that took a while for me to overcome too. I had people through prep that told me like, are you done yet? You look too skinny, this, that. But I felt good and I was set out and determined to do what I had gone in to accomplish. And that was compete. And... I knew I had a great coach that was guiding me, that was helping me through this. I was still working at the gym. I was coaching clients now. And I was starting to see clients transform the way I transformed. And starting to see like their mindset and their confidence and their self-esteem just like beam. And I think that's what helped me. I don't mean to get so fantasy. Um, but it gave me that missing piece. Alcohol gave me that missing piece before. It built that confidence for me, but not in a healthy way. Going to the gym and lifting weights built that confidence for me in a healthy way. It showed me that there was more to just drinking. That I could feel confident and I could be a little bit more outgoing when I would start helping other people because I was starting to feel more confident in myself. I was starting to feel more outgoing. And it's not to say that I don't still have bad days because, believe me, I still have them. But I've found healthier ways to cope with them. And I've found that doing things like this, talking about it, journaling about it, letting my wall down and talking and letting other people in really helps me work through those days. They're not as dark. And when the darkness comes, it goes away faster. Uh, before it might last a couple of days. It might last a week. Now, no more than a day or two. And it comes in waves. And that's okay. It's always going to be a part of me. I'll never not have it, and I've accepted that. I've just found healthier ways to cope and work through it. I don't want to start on another tangent. <laughs> I'm trying to keep these all to like 45 minutes to an hour. Um, I didn't mean to ramble so much about fitness, but it is a big part of my journey. And it's a big part of what helped overcome and break me through that next phase of working out of that dark, drunken mess that I was in. Uh, I do want to talk about my current coping mechanisms, um, my depression and anxiety, and as it creeps up on me now, um, how I work through it, what kind of things trigger me, um, what I'm not still good at working through. I put my wall up pretty quick still. Mostly with the people closest to me. Because I feel like they're still going to hurt me the most. So if I have a bout of darkness, that wall goes up. And it goes up quick. And it comes down faster now. But it goes up. And I've never gotten to that point where I don't let it go up. Even if it just goes halfway. I've always tried to protect myself. I feel like over the years, I don't realize how much I've hurt other people. And also how much other people have hurt me. And when any slice or sliver of that comes creeping back up, the wall goes up. I have a hard time of pushing the past totally back and not letting it dictate my future. I've gotten better with it, 
but it's one of those things that there's certain aspects of life that are so much of a trauma and a trigger that it's hard to set it off, hard to like stop it. Um, those traumas can start to dictate how you live your life, how you hold yourself back, or how you treat other people around you, how you show compassion, how you show love, how you talk, how you express emotion, how you don't express emotion. And again, like I said, it's things I'm working on. Um, I'll start talking about that in the next episode. Um, I hope to do another two, three episodes of just myself talking, and then I'm going to try to bring some guests on. Uh, but I'll talk to you guys more next time about my triggers, my traumas, um, the things that kind of set me off still now. And sometimes I can't work through those. Sometimes I just shut down and shut out and I'm quiet. Some days... I get so anxious and so just like overwhelmed with trying to do this for work or oh you need to do this and what about this and what about the, that and then oh wait you need to clean and you need to do this but oh you have a client so you're going here, you're going here, you're doing this. And I just like want to shut my phone off and not do anything. And I used to do that and I can't now. I can put on Do Not Disturb. I can partially shut the world out. But I have too many people that I'm trying to help that count on me that I feel like I can't just shut down and shut out. They need me as much as I need them. And if I shut the world out, I don't help anyone. I end up in a dark hole. I don't help myself. I don't help those around me. And ultimately, I'm ending up hurting myself and hurting those around me. Don't shut down and shut out. Go for a walk. Go journal. Go to snuggle with your dog. Go watch a show on Netflix and turn your phone on Do Not Disturb for a half hour. When your show's over, call a friend and see how they're doing. Call a family member that you haven't talked to in a while. Reach out to some people. Just because they don't talk about mental illness or just because they might not have anxiety and depression doesn't mean that maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they had a bad day at work. Maybe something's going on in family life and they just want someone to talk to, but they don't want to burden anyone with it. That's how I used to feel, like a burden. Like I was going to burden everyone with my problems. So I would just not tell anyone. And then I, emotionally, I was just like a rock. And I wouldn't tell anyone until I would just explode because it was so built up that it couldn't help but just boil over. Don't boil over. It ends up hurting yourself. It ends up hurting the people closest to you. And oftentimes the people that are hurting don't want to reach out for help. So reach out. Over the weekend, uh, by the time this post, it'll probably be Friday. I was a little late recording this week. To reach out to some friends this weekend, reach out to some family members. If you ever need anything, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, message me on Instagram. Find me on Facebook. I'd be happy to talk to you. Um, if you or anyone you know is going through anything with mental health, anxiety, depression, any of that stuff, please reach out. Let me know how I can help. If you're interested in being on my podcast and sharing your story with me, I would love to talk to you. I would love to hear your story and how you're working through it. So please reach out. Have a great weekend if you're listening to this on Friday. And uh, I look forward to diving in some more into my current headspace on the next episode. Thanks, guys.